Hi color kids, this is Katie Carty Hiley from RainbowBright.net. Welcome back to the Rainbow Land Museum. And guess what I have in my hand this week? That's right, the new Rainbow Bright comic. Well, this is one of the covers. Um, finally came out! October 3rd is when it started showing up in comic shops. So if you have not gotten your copy yet, you should totally get one. Um, I'm going to show you all of the covers that I've got so far. Um, what I did was I got two of each, not of those, um, two of each of these. I got three that were carded and boarded. That's not the right word. Boarded and bagged. Where did I get carded and boarded? Boarded and bagged. They have white boards. It's like a, a thin cardboard that keeps them nice and straight. You know, they won't get wrinkled and bent and stuff. That. Um, and then the plastic obviously keeps them protected from dust and so forth. And they're taped you can see that. Anyway, they're taped on the back to keep that little flap down. Um, so I, I got that and the variant cover that's blank that one of these days I will get an artist to draw on. Um, but then I also got extras of the three, the non-blank ones. Because um, the variants, the blank and the virgin covers, which I don't have yet, but I have on order, so they should be here, I think, soon. Um, the variants are more expensive because they're more rare, but all of these covers cost exactly the same. And like I've said in the other video, the interiors of all of these are exactly the same. But I wanted to get all of them, and I wanted to be able to, at least for this first issue, have two of each so I could... I don't know why. I might not do that with every issue, but with the first one it was just that compulsion, like, how far two of each? Like, one in the bag and one out of the bag, but we'll see. Um, the one I'm going to be using today is this one just because the cover of this one has a slight imperfection, so if I get it a little bit bent up flipping through, it won't be the end of the world. Uh, I'm trying to keep the others as pristine as possible, but what I'm going to talk about is the actual content of the comic this time around, so spoiler warning! If you have not read this yet, please don't watch this video until you do. Um, I don't want to spoil this for you. I want you to have the experience of reading this for the first time. Um, I mean, I've given you a little bit of background in my other videos, but I want you to go into this with as fresh eyes as possible so you get maximum enjoyment and surprise and all of that goodness from it. Um, so just warning you now, but I'm, I'm still not going to be actually showing you pages. Um, that's just out of respect for the creators because they need to make money on this. Um, that's how we're going to get more of these is if they, you know, sell. Um, as far as I know, they have six ordered for the first, I don't know what they call that, the first volume, I guess. Um, that I believe once all six are done, they're going to bind those into one volume. They'll obviously be thicker than one comic book is. It'll still be paperback, but that kind of um, trade volume can then be used in libraries and um, for anybody who wants one. But um, anyway, where was I going with that? <laughs> Lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, maybe it'll come back to me, but yeah. So right, right, I'm not going to show you all of the pages, but I'm at least going to go through the story and give some of my opinions on some things from the story. And also I've pulled out a bunch of quotes from a bunch of different reviews about this comic. Um, there's like 27, I think now, reviews out there um, of people who have reviewed this comic, and it's from all types. Like, some of them are diehard fans like myself, some of them are casual fans that remember the show a little from when they were kids, some were not the right age, like they were in high school when it came out, so it was back in the 80s, so they were like, it had a passing knowledge of it, but it was not something they would sit down and watch, and others had just zero um, knowledge of this property whatsoever. So it was really interesting to see from all kind of walks of fandom life uh, what people thought of this comic. And it was really, like, I don't know if this is always the case, but it was almost unanimously positive. And even the articles that had some, like, negative comments about it, at the end of the article, they would still recommend it. They would be like, okay, so I have this issue and that issue, but I would actually still recommend this for adults and kids alike, because it's 
really well done. It's really thought out. It's great, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, but I I can't imagine that that's common. That a comment gets unanimously like you know four out of five stars at least um, kind of ratings on so many different reviews. So I think that bodes well. I really do. Um, but fans like us need to support it if we want this to continue and if we want more things to potentially come from the Rainbow Bright property. So here we go, issue number one. Um, I'm gonna start, I think, just going through it myself, talking a little bit about the story, and then I'll go through my notes um, from the quotes I've taken from these articles and probably make some more comments about those as well. Um, first, I wanna give all of the, uh, oops, gotta bend that. Um, accolades, that's not the word, attention, whatever. I want to read off who worked on this because you all need to know um, if you don't already. Writer Jeremy Whitley, artist Brittany Williams, colorist Valentina Pinto, letterer Taylor Esposito, editor Kevin Katner, cover A, which is this one, is Paulina, I think it's Ganushal? Ganesha? I'm, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, Paulina. Uh, this cover is by Tony Fleeks. And then there is the classic cover, which is the Hallmark, you know, classic artwork. And then there is special thanks to John Nenz, Hannah Carey, Kevin Dilmore, Peter Martin, and Jack Pullen at Hallmark, and Alexis, sorry, Alexis Person. So that's all the people we have to thank for this existing, you know, and obviously Hallmark and Dynamite as well. So thank you to all of you for contributing to this. So we start out reading a story that's being written by Willow. So Willow and Wisp are the two friends that we meet uh, in the first half, I'd say, of this comic. And they're the best of friends. They are fantastic. I love them. I wish I could play with them and just like go back in time to their age and go play Knights and Wizards because uh, oh my gosh they have so much fun and it's totally the kind of thing I would have been into when I was their age. So it starts out basically Willow is drawing her own comic book like drawing and writing. I, I, I'll show you that page at least. Um, this is not part of the actual comic that we're reading. This is a comic that Willow is writing kind of based on the stories that her and Wisp have come up with during their playtimes. Um, I wanted to pull out a couple of things that were just of note. So they are talking about the good people of a village called Lenore. Um, I thought it was, but I had to look it up to be sure. That is the French word for black. Um, so I, th I find it interesting that at the very beginning they're talking about a village that has a color associated with it. So in something called a rainbow bright, there's going to be lots of color, uh, both mentioned and shown on the page. So that was just a cool little nod for those of us who like to look up name etymologies. <laughs> I get that from my Harry Potter time, uh, on Alohomora. Anyway, then um, there's clearly a bully of sorts at their school that they kind of make fun of in this comic named Joey Gregory. Um, I'm curious if uh, Jeremy Whitley, the author, knows someone named Joey or Joey Gregory um, <laughs> who's basing this on. Who knows, but it's funny. Um, and yeah, Willow says, you know, we'll save your town even though that jerk Joey picked on my hair. So it's, it's adorable. And we get to see them in their imagine, in their, the way they would imagine themselves, kind of their warrior aspects here. So Willow has her full outfit on with her cloak and her staff, and uh, Wisp has her full armor and sword and has rainbow streaks in her hair. Love it! So now let me just say real quick, this is not necessarily what she's going to look like as Rainbow Bright. This is just what wizard, what do they call her? Um, warrior, no, wizard warrior, no, sorry. It's wizard, <laughs> there's so many W's. The wonderful wizard Willow and the wild warrior Wisp. Okay, so this is wild warrior Wisp look. We don't know if this is anything like what she's going to look like as Rainbow Bright. Might be, might not be, um, but just wanted to mention that. So, but it's adorable. I love it. It's fantastic. So this is the first page. And then we hear Wisp outside Willow's house yelling at Willow, like, Willow, hello. Um, and she's basically asking her to come outside so they can play. 
And so Willow grabs all of her gear because they are not just playing pretend, they are LARPing, live action role playing. So she's got a whole cosplay outfit made up that she wears um, and uses during these playtimes. And Wisp has her own wooden sword that she's made. So it's so cool. I, I just love the fact that they are that big of a geek. I, I, seriously, that's nerdy. That's geeky. And I am all for it. I'm not making fun of them at all. Like, that's that's a compliment in my mind if you're a, a geek or a nerd. Um, that you're my you're my people. So these are my people. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I love just the creativity they put into all of this. It's great. So we see Willow running through the house to go join Wisp, but her parents are you know telling her don't run down the stairs. You can't play with a broken leg now, can you? And she has to ask her dad's permission to go out, and he says yes that she can. Um, but makes sure where she's going to be and make sure she's close by the house so that um, they will hear him if he calls for them. So very responsible, excellent parents that are making sure they know where their child is. Um, and I'll talk about some comments that have to do with this. Oh, I meant to bring up something else. I can get to it in a minute. Um, about the parenting we see in this. And that's just the first instance we see. But it, it's great. I love their... their um, highly functional family you know they actually are paying attention to what their child is doing and that these kids are playing outdoors they're not just stuck on a computer in front of a tv um playing video games whatnot they're using their imaginations which is something we had to do well I didn't have to we, we didn't have tvs when i was a kid but and video games okay but we didn't have computers the way we do now we did not have the internet so this is the kind of play we were more forced to do as a kid um but we also enjoyed doing it i'm not saying forces and we hated it that um we kind of resorted to this kind of play because we didn't have all the options that kids these days do but i think a kid reading this might go oh right there's the outdoors. I could do this too. So maybe this will even inspire some kids to get off of their technological devices and get some fresh air. That would be great. We need more of that. So they go out in the woods and the lot beside Willow's house and start playing their game. Um, so they're just making up, you know, what's going on around them and talking to these you know, halt foul creatures and we're going to destroy you and all this. So the Wisp is hungry. So they decide to go back to Willow's house to get something to eat. They have to stay in character. Um, so Willow makes up another story to kind of, okay, what can we do to incorporate food into this quest? So they got to go fight the, is the centaur? Uh, the cyclops, sorry. They have to go fight the cyclops to get to his food. Um, and they come in the house and the mom is like, no money shoes. And they're like, mom, you have to stay in character. So she's like, okay. The floor is cursed and muddy shoes will get you thrown in the dungeon. So I love that the mom plays along with them and joins in. It's adorable. Um, Wisp eats her sandwich and half of Willow's because <laughs> she's hungry and apparently she always skips breakfast. Um, we'll get to something later on that may allude to she just not that she didn't have food for, there wasn't food for breakfast, but that maybe she, it wasn't prepared for her. So she just doesn't worry about it. But some kids just don't eat breakfast. So you don't need to read too much into that. Um, but it's a cute interaction because she asks and Willow is like, I always say, yes, of course you can take it. But Wisp is still like, well, I, I still needed to ask. It would be rude not to. So they're just, they're so respectful to each other and it's so sweet. And I love their friendship. It, it's really fantastic. And so they're playing again after they eat and the dad comes by and they're like, dad. And then he joins in too. He's like, oh, sorry, this giant troll just needs to get to his office. So they're playing and then it starts to rain and it's getting dark outside. So Wisp needs to go home and uh, Willow's dad offers to drive her, which he does. And it's, it's really sweet. He lets them, lets her borrow a rain jacket so she doesn't get soaked on the way home. And she like offers to give the jacket back once he drops her off and he's like no just hang on to it it's fine and so then we go into wisp's house and <laughs> i love the what's on the television um there's just these cats and hearts um because and I've, i'm a big cat lover so i'm just like yay kitties but she comes in and says hey mom i'm home but then she sees her mom is sleeping on the sofa in front of the tv and there's a, a note she's left um it's not like the mom has just 
conked out and not consider her her daughter that's going to be coming home says hey honey dinner is in the microwave wake me up and tell me how your day was love mom um but Wes decides to just get the dinner and eat it and not disturb her mom because um, she says, you look way too tired to wake up. We'll talk tomorrow. Um, she kind of whispers that, I think, to her and says, night mom. So Wes puts her dishes away, starts getting ready for bed, and then she hears this bang outside. Um, she tries to look out the window to see what it is, but she can't see anything. She can only see shadows. And she goes outside to realize that there are, like, shadow monsters! Uh, in my previous review, I was talking about there was something that reminded me of Star Stealer, and this is what I was talking about. And it's not, they don't look exactly like this at all, but remember when they get to the Dark Princess's castle, this is Rainbow and Chris arrive there, and there are those shadow monsters that, they start out small, and then they all, like, group together and make this huge one. Um, because these guys... It's like in some scenes they are more joined together than others, but I think that they, I think the first one they don't look joined, but then they kind of become joined. Um, but this is, this is what the shadow monsters look like. So that's just, it kind of reminded me of, of Star Stealer, which I thought was cool. So they have drained Wisp's mother's car of color. It was blue and now it is gray. And they see that Wisp is wearing a blue sweatshirt. So they try to start stealing the blue from her shirt. Um, and she's just like, what are you guys doing? And so she, like, goes and starts fighting them. She's, like, telling them to leave the car alone and starts, like, hitting them with her sword. And they're saying, like, wait, you shouldn't even be able to see us, much less hit us. So they're like, what? But at the same time, they want the blue from her shirt because apparently they're stealing all of the blue from the, from the world. Um, so she's like, uh, no, leave me alone and starts running away. Um, because they clearly can't be defeated by just her and her wooden sword. Um, and then something very Harry Potter-ish happens. And this is basically when the shadow monster is trying to absorb the blue off of her shirt. I think I can show you this. Um, <laughs> I'll show you panels from time to time. Right here. What does that remind you of? That is totally like a Dementor trying to suck the soul out of somebody. So I don't know if that's what they were going for, but that's what it reminded me of. And I love it so much. <laughs> Anything that reminds me of, of Potter, I'm just like, yes. So yeah, um, she, she figures out that she is able to strike them, but she's not going to be able to just defeat them. So she is like, okay, I got to get out of here and get some help. So she starts running. Um... She thinks they, that she lost them, and then, no, they're behind her. And, again, the bottom of them, it's, like, they don't have feet because they're shadows. Um, but the bottom is, like, it's like a three-headed monster type thing. They're all joined together in, in the later scenes. So then, Twinkle, Twink, um, but in this one, Twinkle, shows up. You've seen him already, but there he is. So, okay, Twink apparently can just levitate or fly, or whatever you want to say, in this mythos, which is interesting. That was one of the modes of transportation I was talking about in my last video. So that's something brand new. He's never been able to do that in previous incarnations. But it works really well to keep him at eye level with her. Um, otherwise, she would just be looking down a lot, and that might... I don't know. I think that would be weird if they had to keep switching back and forth. Um, like showing her face and then showing his face and her face and his face. So I think it makes sense actually for him to just be right here and they can just have a conversation and look at each other. Um, so he starts introducing himself because <laughs> at first he's like, ah, what, is, what are you? Um, he's like, don't be scared. Oh yeah, you've never seen a Sprite before. I'm a Sprite. My name is Twinkle. And uh, so they have this funny interaction where she tells him her name and then he kind of starts explaining what's happening, that these are, oh, let's see, the king, talking about the Shadow King, has recently captured the Guardian of Blue. They are attempting to drain all existing blue from the world. Um, to which Wisp says, so should I just take off my shirt? And he says, young lady, running the streets topless is hardly fitting behavior for a hero. I laughed so hard at that line. I mean, there are a lot of humorous lines that I laughed at, at this in this comic, but that's that was a, a top one. I was just like, oh my gosh, that's hysterical. Um, and yeah, so he, he 
still kind of explaining things and then says, oh, we can just teleport out of here, but then realizes he doesn't have enough power to do that. Um, so she's like, well, how do we get you power? How do we charge you up? And he says he needs light. Um, he says he's low on light. So he says, um, yeah, if I were exposed to a very bright white light, that should give me enough power. And so they uh, start running toward Willow's house because Wisp re remembers that they have an alarm system that she accidentally tripped once before trying to get into Willow's window. And when it goes off, really bright floodlights come on. And Twink is like, what, if, what does flooding have to do with any of this? So there's, you know, it's just characters from two different worlds interacting, um, talking about verbiage that doesn't make sense to either one, and they have to kind of explain, uh, which is a cute dynamic. So it's like, it, it establishes that um, Twinkle is definitely not from Earth and does not visit it often, <laughs> that he doesn't know what some of these things mean or what they are. So finally, through many attempts, they get Willow's attention, and they're, they're still having trouble setting off the alarm system. And uh, Willow, who's also wearing a cat shirt, just want to point out, more cats, yay, um, takes matters into her own hands, uh, which is awesome. I mean, both of these girls are super brave and, well, just, we'll just talk about brave at, at the moment because they're both being very brave. Like, Wisp just jumped right into this battle and then very quickly figured out what she needed to do to get away from them. Um, to vanquish them for the moment or whatever and and did it and then she wakes up Willow and Willow's immediately like, okay what can I do what can I do to help and she figures it out really quick um, she looks around uh, her room she picks up her staff and she breaks the window to set off the alarm which is kind of that's ballsy like most kids would be so scared to break a window because they would think their parents would ground them for a month or their life you know um, but she has the confidence that she could explain this to her parents and they would believe her and trust that she did it for a good reason. So I like all of that as well. It's kind of implied. Um, so she breaks the window, the lights come on, Twinkle immediately absorbs the light he needs to recharge himself. And as Wisp is falling off of the tree that she had been climbing, trying to get Willow's attention, um, he transports them to Rainbow Land. So when Willow and her parents get out the front door, Wisp is gone. And the shadow monsters. It's all, they're, they're just like, what, what happened? Where did they go? Um, but Willow did see the shadow monsters when she looked out the window and saw Wisp struggling. So she knows that something really bad was happening. And uh, so she knows like, it's not just a case of a missing person. They're not just gonna be like, oh yeah, she was stolen by some bad guy and taken away. Um, and again, we'll, we'll see in future episodes if her family does believe her, as I, I think they will. But again, it's it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow. It's like your kid plays Knights and Wizards all the time. But to say that something fantastical like a shadow monster is real, and that's why her friend is now missing, that's going to take, yeah, some explanation and some, some trust on their part. So that'll be interesting to see how that goes. And Wisp leaves her wooden sword behind. Um, it's just on the ground at Willow's feet. And I'm not going to show you this panel because you need, or this page, because you need to buy this comic to see this. But the last page, they arrive in Rainbow Land. Um, oh, what's the question that he's asked? Oh, on the previous page it says, Twinkle, where are we? And says, good question, Wisp. Welcome to Rainbow Land. And that's where they are, but I'm not going to show it to you. <laughs> But suffice it to say, it does not look, at least currently, it does not look like the Rainbow Land we're used to. Um, and I'm really excited to see where it goes from here. Like, if, if it just, if you turn the page and it looked like regular old Rainbow Land with all of the bright colors and everything, then you would be like, what, what's the, you know, why, why are we worried? Why, where's the King of Shadows? Where are his minions? What's the drama? What's the conflict? Um, but because it looks the way it does, you're left going, oh, something's gone down or is going down and this is about to get real. So, ah, it's, it's such a good cliffhanger. It's such a good cliffhanger. I'll just say that. Um, 
And then there's a preview for the next issue. It's got a, a picture of issue number two, the cover. And it says, Wisp and Twinkle run into trouble in a magical land when they find themselves face to face with mad scientist Murky and his sidekick Lurky. But as they try to make their way to safety, they discover an important part of what it means to be Rainbow Bright. So maybe we'll see her as Rainbow Bright in the next issue. I don't know. But like I said, we don't see her as Rainbow Bright here, just as Wisp. Um, but I love that Murky and Lurky are going to be introduced and that they're still here. Um, you know, us old school fans are always wondering what's going to be the same, what's going to be different. So that's something that's going to be the, well, we don't know if they're going to look and act exactly the same, but their names at least are the same. And he's still a mad scientist and Lurky is still his sidekick. So I think we can assume it's going to be very, very similar. And then the very last page shows all the different variant covers for issue one. So, like I said, there's all there's eight of them. Uh, this one down here was the latest that just came out at New York City Comic Con. It was an exclusive for that convention. Um, Hallmark did say if they had any left over, they would sell them online. So if I see tale of that or a link for that or anything, I will let you guys know. Um, otherwise, you might have to resort to eBay or something if you weren't at that convention. Um, I love all of this. So let me get into some of these um, comments and I'm actually going to just pause this and come back because I know it's going to like stop on me while I'm talking and I don't, don't, don't want that to happen. So I'll be right back with the rest of this. Okay, so I kind of organized these comments into things about writing, art, um, etc. We'll, we'll just start from the top and go down and see where we land. And I'll probably throw some of my own comments in here and there. But unless I say otherwise, these are just quotes from articles that uh, from other reviewers. And I didn't attribute every single one because there was just too many. Uh, but I have links to all of these articles on my blog. And I will link to that blog article. <laughs> my blog article that has links to all of these blog articles. <laughs> so you can read them yourself. Um, but okay. Writing. So one reviewer said that there is great attention to character, which I agree with. Uh, one says it is, hold on, okay, sorry. <laughs> had to reorient myself with what they were talking about. It is with this back half of the debut that the creative team starts to stretch their action muscles and set the bar for what kind of set pieces the title will be dealing with in future issues. Yeah. Um, did I say this is about writing? I think I did. This is the writing section. So this is all um, stuff for Jeremy and, and the great job he did. Uh, one reviewer said, I'm especially impressed that while the title reflects Rainbow herself as our lead, it reads as though there are two leads in both Wisp and Willow. Each of these girls are bursting with personality. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Next one says, Whit Whitley has a remarkable knack for taking something primarily aimed at kids and making it accessible for even adults. Yes, he does. Next is Jeremy Whitley has won many awards for his ability to weave together stories. His most notable achievement in this author's opinion is the way he makes sure that there are stories for his little girl to be inspired by. He writes stories for the children that don't fit. He writes for the imaginative, the fantasy lovers, the knights of all sizes and shapes. I love that quote so much because it's so true. Um, Especially in this one, like like I was saying, like Wisp and Willow, total nerdy geek girls that probably, like, you know, there's that bully, what's his name, Gregory, Joey Gregory, they're at least being bullied by one person and making fun of Willow's hair. Um, so I would imagine, as a lot of nerdy geeky kids can be, they're probably being bullied and such at school, but they've found a relationship in each other that is perfect. It just melds so beautifully. And yeah, they're, they're perfect. They're the perfect best friends. I love them so much. But I, I agree with this, that he writes, because I've been reading his Princeless um, stories as well, which I'm still getting through. I will review those one of these days, I promise. But I, I, I need to finish the rest of them uh, to get caught up. But oh, that happens a lot in that series as well. And he's so good at taking those characters and making them relatable, um, drawing us in to so that we care about them, we care about what happens to them. And for those of us who are reading comics, let's be real, most comic readers are the geeky nerdy types. 
so that he's writing for the imaginative, the fantasy lovers, the knights of all sizes and shapes. That's us. That's anyone reading this comic, pretty much. Um, so yeah, it was just great. It's great. And well, like you said, um, and we've said this, or I've said this in previous interviews and reviews, whatnot, that Jeremy writes stories that his little girls uh, would be inspired by, which obviously this is an another good one. Um, but I also want to say, like that author didn't say it, but um, I want to say that this is not just for girls. Like, yes, if you look at the covers, they they look a little girly. Look, well, I'll be honest, they look like they're for girls. They're purples and, well, mostly purples, not really pinks. This was more fuchsia-ish. Um, maybe this will be the least gender specific one of the three. Um, but that is not to say the boys will not enjoy this or should be deterred from reading this. Um, if I had a little boy, I would absolutely give him this and hope that he enjoyed it. Um, I would read it with him and be like, what do you think? And you know, a boy might say, eh, maybe not, but some boys are probably gonna just not care because they're talking about trolls and cyclops and I forget the other monsters, but this crazy knights and wizards and that you know fantastical stuff that little boys play too. This you know, that type of play is not specific to girls or boys. It's anyone, any any gender. Um so this is definitely a comic that any gender and any age can enjoy. So I just wanted to, to mention that real quick. So regarding the art, I uh, separated this out into lines, colors, lettering, um, and then combination, because some quotes mentioned several things at once. So as far as the line art, um, so this is, I don't want to get it wrong, <laughs> Brittany Williams. Here we go. Uh, one person said it was cartoonish but emotive. Another said traditional looking cartoon character designs. Another said, this is regarding Brittany and Valentina who did the colors. Uh, the pair's style looks like a cross between the anim anime inspired action of Steven Universe and the more comedic works of Kim Reaper's Sarah Grayley. So I, I threw a few comparison quotes in there because I am not the person to ask like, art-wise, what other comics does this look like? Because I don't know. I don't read any other comics. I mean, now that I'm getting into this and Princeless and getting into that world a bit, I'm finding that I actually like it more than I thought I would. So I might start reading more comics. I've got, um, while I was picking this up, I got the one issue I was missing of The Unstoppable Wasp. So I'm going to read through all of that once I'm done with Princeless. Um, so I, yeah, I very well may be reading more comics going forward, but at this point in time, I'm not the person to ask. So I, I wanted to rely on some quotes to give you guys an idea of what other properties people are comparing this art to, in case you're interested. And yeah, whatever. And if you have your own opinions, please leave them in the comments. I'm interested to see what you think it reminds you of as well. Um, regarding the cover, I didn't choose a bunch of cover con and there really weren't that many because everyone loves the covers i mean that's universal they're gorgeous there's no question nobody has said anything negative about these covers they're all three of them are fantastic but regarding paulina's cover this one someone said it isn't eye candy it's eye soul food <laughs> i just love the way that was phrased i had to include it uh someone else said and this is back to the line art so um Brittany, here we go says, similar to Batman the Animated Series. Another said, Williams uses an art style that feels like a happy mix between Saturday morning cartoon and Sunday morning newspaper comic strip. Characters are extremely emotive throughout the issue, with Williams affording them very detailed facial expressions that are expressive and engaging. I saw a lot of people talking about how emotive the characters are, um, which is just something I didn't really know to look for or to pay attention to, but Clearly, it's, it's something you should pay attention to, and she did a good job of. Uh, let's see. The next one said, I had seen some previous Rainbow Bright art and thought it may be a little too cute. This art really got the mix right. So that's probably from someone who's not a hardcore fan like us. Um, and Also, this video is not just for hardcore fans. I'm sorry if I make comments like that that don't necessarily apply to you. I don't mean to. It's just I know the majority of people who watch my videos are hardcore Rainbow Bright fans, so... 
that's mostly who I'm talking to. <laughs> I don't mean to like ostracize anyone else who's watching this. Um, so we probably would not say the old art is too cute. We think it's just the right amount of cute. We think it's perfection. But <laughs> it's interesting though to see from another perspective that someone could think that's a little too cutesy, but this is not. So it, it might appeal to a wider audience. And, you know, like I was saying before, with it not being a gender specific thing, even though right now our two main characters are female, there are going to be other characters introduced and Twink is a male. Um, so, and Murky Lurky are male, you know, there's going to be other characters that come into play. So, yeah. What I'm trying to say, the cuteness factor might be working in its favor to not be too cutesy um, so that it uh, appeals to all genders. Uh, next person said, her minimalist line work is descriptively playful and expressive in bringing these girls and their worlds to life. Uh, next says, the costumes are practical, cute, and age appropriate, and the weapons are beautifully designed too. I liked that comment as well because we know that in some fan art, uh, <laughs> Rainbow Road's not wearing age appropriate uh, clothing, but Wisp and Willow absolutely are in this comic, so I have no doubts that once she does turn into Rainbow Bright, it'll still be an age-appropriate representation of Rainbow Bright. Um, just because it reminded me, I'm wearing a shirt today that reminds me a bit of Paulina's version. Um, this cover, it's not the same, but because I, I got this a few years back, I think. Um, but it just reminded me because it's slightly aged up and the armbands are, are similar. By the way, Paulina, I haven't mentioned this yet, um, the fact that the stripes on her arms are in rainbow order, that is a huge deal to me and I love it so much. Please keep doing that. And 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 Brittany and Valentina, when, when you get to the rainbow bright part when she turns into it, please keep doing that. Some people will disagree with me. <laughs> there are plenty of rainbow bright fans that are like, no, it has to be the old color scheme like this. You can't vary it. But hey, this is a whole new thing. They're going to be changing things up. Twink already looks different than he did in the original. So why not update Rainbow Bright's look as well? And it's the perfect time to make her armbands be in rainbow order, which I think they should have been from the beginning. Just put that out there. Thank you, Paulina. Okay. <laughs> Where was I? Um, okay. The artwork from Brittany Williams is very nice. It's rather similar to how she applied her style to Goldie Vance, possibly a little more simplified and exaggerated, and it works very well for the story. The character designs for Twinkle and the Shadow Brutes are interesting, with the latter being menacing, but definitely not too scary if you want to share it with little ones. Which is a good point. Um, I think this is probably geared more to like, I don't know, ages seven and above, but like that person just said, the, the shadow brutes, um, as they call them, are not that scary. I mean, they're scary. They got glowing red eyes and they're big shadows, but they're not Dementor scary. So a little kid's, I very seriously doubt, not going to have you know, nightmares about these things. So I think you could share this with kids of, of any age. Um, and I actually saw a picture online of, I think, a little four-year-old girl who it was her, her bedtime story and she absolutely loved it. So there you go. Next comment, Miss Williams' art is highly dynamic for such a cartoony look, and there is always a sense of motion in her panels. My main quibble with her work is her odd tendency to occasionally reduce characters' eyes to just pupils. It can be a jarring look, especially when they have normal-looking eyes the rest of the time. Um, I included that piece of slightly negative commentary because I actually agree with it a bit. Um, the more I look at it and read it, the more it doesn't stand out to me. And I'm, I if it continues happening going forward, I don't think I'm going to care. But when it did first happen, like Wisp, when her eyes are reduced just to people's, I was just like, whoa, what just happened to her eyes? And then I was noticing throughout the rest of it how it would go back and forth. Like, And sometimes it just had to do with how close their face was to, to you. <laughs> if it's a close up, they're going to have big eyes. If they're further away, you may just see the pupils. Um, so once I started comparing when it happened and getting that, I was like, okay, maybe that's why. It's just easier to do when they're further back. You don't have as much room to do detail like a full eye. Um, but it was a little jarring the first time I saw it, I'll, I'll admit. So 
that's just that was the only that's the only person though that I saw that said that. Everyone else, nobody mentioned the eyes at all. So it may just be me and this one person. Um, <laughs> but I just thought I'd throw it out there in case anybody else noticed it as well. But like I said, not a deal breaker. If it keeps happening, I, I really don't care. Um, so colors. This is for Valentina Pinto, correct? Let me get, make sure I get your full name right. Yes. Uh, first comment. In a kid's comic, it's all too easy to make things too bright, too big, too bold. Pinto creates a world that's bright and inviting and warm, but shifts easily from one setting to another. The careful use of colors makes their mention obvious and striking, which is exactly what this story needs. Totally agree. There's a lot of great color comments here. Uh, next one. There are no dull flat tones here. Instead, Pinto adds depth and nuance to William's work with textured tones and a rich variety of color. Mm -hmm. She uses rich colors and her shading makes characters and scenery pop. Yes. Colorist Valentina Pinto brings the magic and is the perfect complement to William's line work. Her simply rendered palette is bright without being harsh. Even the night scene is brought to vivid life under her skillful eye. All the vivid coloring contributes to a jarringly effective last page reveal with Wisp and Twink in Rainbow Land. Which again, not going to tell you. <laughs> but it does. All of that is true. And like they said, it's bright without being harsh. And it's not even that bright to, to my eyes. But I... My eyes are sensitized to this level of brightness, to this level of brightness. So it, it takes a lot for me to say something is bright. Um, I honestly thought the colors were mostly muted, not too muted, but a bit muted until Twinkle shows up. And then some of the backgrounds behind him, we start getting some pops of brighter colors, um, which to me was like, oh, we're getting closer to the magic, closer to the rainbow, closer to the rainbow land, which... We were, um, but I, I, I like that. I like that there was a variation that kind of evolved throughout the whole issue. Very, very well done. Um, next comment. Valentino's colors are still rather muted and the backdrops not terribly detailed. The juicy and vibrant colors are a great complement to the potential of this series though. While we may not see the sparkles and big colors that we expect from Rainbow just yet, there's sure to be a world of hues waiting in future issues. Precisely. I think we're going to see a lot of cool colors coming up. Next comment. As color is a very important part of the story, it draws your eye how Valentina Pinto applies it. For the most part, we get a lot of bright primary colors. From the opening writing sequence through to when Wisp returns home at night, everything's bright and colorful. See, I kind of disagree with that, but that's okay. Um, although somewhat, yeah, okay. Uh, it's only when she's confronted by the shadow brutes that we start to see a change. Given the final page of the issue, I'm very interested to see what happens in Rainbow Land. I think the bright colors they may be talking about is like Willow's costume. Cause, but again, it's not bright purple. It's a dark purple. So if you like, look here, I wouldn't call those bright colors to me. That's darker colors. They're still vivid. I mean, it's not like you can't tell the difference of what she's wearing from the color of the floor. I mean, obviously you can see the difference of the colors, but it's something like dark purple. It's not bright, shy violet, you know? So let's move on to letters. Uh, Taylor Esposito on letters only adds to the overall perfection of the story. Esposito demonstrates his proficiency at the job with evenly spaced letters that are the perfect size for the average reader. Nothing is more cumbersome as dialogue you must strain to see or words so big it covers half of the artwork. But with different and simple fonts, situations, and speakers, the lettering remains a consistent quality that makes reading Rainbow Bright fun and enjoyable without taking over the experience. I know that was a long quote, but it was a good one. And I had to give Taylor some love. That's not the last one, don't worry. Um, next, he uses a variety of fonts which keep the story interesting. The words are a good readable size with bold emphasis that bring the story along without taking over the balloons. Mm -hmm. This is a wordier comic considering its targeted age range, but it still retains a reasonable reading level. The comic is never overwhelmed with word bubbles and there are moments of pure fun thanks to Esposito's lettering. I would agree. And last comment for that, for the opening page, we get to see Willow writing her own fiction, allowing Taylor Esposito to use a mixed case 
font. Williams, to present the layout in a fashion representing it a book. Did I read that right? Present the layout in a fashion representing it a book. Representing a book? Whatever. And Whitley to give us a direct impression of Willow's imagination. The stylistic difference is quite nice, and I'd like to see more of it in future issues. So yeah, that first page that's different from the rest, which in my last video I was talking about reminded me of Princeless, that. I would like to see more of that too. It's fun. It's fun to see Willow's stories that she draws and writes. Um, okay, comments about both Brittany and Valentina, right? Yeah. Uh, from the outset, Rainbow Bright reads like a cartoon was pressed between its pages. Artist Brittany Williams has a background in character design and storyboarding, colored by Valentina Pinto. The combined strength of their work resembles high quality stills from the tie-in animated series this comic seems to be made to pitch for. <laughs> Maybe it is! Who knows? But I, I like that description. Next, uh, the character designs and look are friendly and inviting enough for young and old readers alike. Williams skirts the line between cartoon and too cartoony very well. Additionally, the comic lives up to the name of Bright with the help of Pinto's fantastic coloring. And last comment here, the art of the book is its biggest asset. Being a story based around the concept of color, getting the visuals right is imperative. The art style is perfect for 2018 kids as it subscribes to the rotund looking styles of today's kids TV shows. Example, Steven Universe and the controversial Thundercats reboot. The lines are crisp and straightforward. The colors are gorgeous and uncomplicated. I, I agree with this, um, but I also wanted to make a quick um, comment of my own. Um, where did it say? The rotund looking styles of today's kids TV shows. So they weren't talking about rotund looking people, but it reminded me. I enjoy the fact that Wisp is not real thin. Um, this is a conversation Jeremy and I had off camera, not on our interview, but he, or they, purposely made her a bit rounder, a bit thicker, like a child should be. Um, and I'm not saying that Willow is too thin or that she shouldn't be thin or anything like that. Um, they just have different body types. And I like that. I like that they don't look exactly the same in that sense. Um, and I like that Wisp is just a little bit shorter, a little bit rounder, younger. I mean, they're probably the same age, but you know what I mean. And there are some scenes where Wisp just looks so young, like when she's sitting on the couch while her mom is sleeping, when she's eating her dinner. Where is it? There it is. Like, she looks so young and tiny in that image, and it's just adorable. Um, yeah. So I like the fact that they're keeping her young. She might not be quite as young as the this particular cover would suggest. She looks a little older than this, but not much. Really not much at all. So I'm really pleased that they kept her a young, a young heroine as she's always been, and I think she always should be. Okay, uh, how long am I? Okay, so I got some time. Uh, <laughs> these comments are regarding all of the people um, dealing with the art and lettering. Uh, in Goldie Vance, I loved the way Brittany Williams kept bodies, especially girl bodies. Oh, see, this is going to talk about what I was just talking about. Um, start that over. In Goldie Vance, I love the way that Brittany Williams kept bodies, especially girl bodies, softly rounded in ways that made them feel appropriate, appropriately young and real. In Rainbow Bright, that's even more apparent. Willow and Wisp are young and they have little girl bodies. Their expressions are big and clear without ever being caricatures. The backgrounds are created with easy flourishes that give just enough detail, keeping it from overwhelming the target audience. The panels are readable for almost any age group, with little in the way of complicated layouts. This comic is made for little girls and little girls can read this. Very well bet. I love it. Uh, while we have yet to see the full range of color, the art by Brittany Williams is absolutely gorgeous. Her cartoony style is a perfect fit for this franchise and her seemingly simple illustrations are complex and full of emotion. If you've seen her work in books like Goldie Vance or Patsy Walker Hellcat, you may know what to expect but Williams is churning out career-defining work in this issue alone. That's... wow. Um, the colors by Valentina Pinto accentuate Williams' art and really make every panel pop. 
Color will be an important element in this series going forward, and the artistic team is only getting started. The lettering by Taylor Esposito matches the tone and humor of the dialogue perfectly. Everything in this book is just plain beautiful. Agreed. And last one about the art. The illustrations are bright and eye-catching. The writing is witty and fun, but not so much that it would go over the heads of younger readers. The lettering is well-placed and non-intrusive, which again for younger readers and readers like me with dys dyslexia makes all the difference. So see, that's a viewpoint I would not have thought of on my own because I'm not dyslexic myself, but I love hearing from someone who is and for them this is easy to read. And that, that's amazing and speaks very well to it being easy for children to be able to read as well. That's great. I uh, got some comments here about pacing. This debut takes its time getting to the magical girl fun of the IP. Yep. This issue really works hard to establish our cast first and then get to the fun second. The story begins slower than most young reader comics, so if you're expecting to dive right into the action of rainbows and unicorns, hold your horses for a sec. <laughs> I love that comment. Although this is only the first issue and the tone of the story doesn't rush through too fast, the pace is really nicely done. I quite like the easy way that Jeremy Whitley guides us into the story. For much of the issue, this is just a couple of friends playing. It gives us a good grounded look into the characters and establishes a love for fantasy fiction and imagination. It makes the transition into the actual fantasy elements of Rainbowland, Twinkle, and the minions of the Shadow King more interesting when they occur. Totally agree. These are great comments. And last one there. Uh, what I love the most about this first issue is that it takes its time, letting us get to know Wisp through Willow and Willow through Wisp. They are both sweet, fun, and oh my gosh, adorable. Yes. <laughs> all of that's very, I agree with all of it. Um, like I said, again, in my last review, my, my spoiler free one, that it is slower paced than a cartoon episode would be. And that's what they're that's what they're saying here that it takes its time getting to the drama, um, establishing the world, establishing the characters, so we get to know about them and care about them before we're whisked off into adventure. So I really like the way this is set up, and it really just makes us crave the second issue that much more. It's great. Uh, I have a couple of comments here about race that I wanted to include because I think it's important. Uh, first one says, it's an empowering story for young girls and girls of color, as Willow herself is a black girl, that I feel would be welcomed with open arms and hearts by the targeted demographic. A plus. And second comment, when the origin story of Rainbow Bright leads with a black girl breaking from her fantasy comic to put her homemade mage hat over her natural hair and argue about live action role play with her friend, the moment is remarkable in how normal it is. She's not a sidekick, but a precocious nerd raised by supportive, wryly humorous parents. Not much more to say other than that. I think they covered it, but I, I just agree. I love that we have a character of color that is very important right off the bat. They're not saving her for, you know, season two or whatever they call it, you know, volume two. Um, they are just right off the bat, like, here. Here's some more representation that we did not have in the 80s and is sorely needed. So I'm really glad that that was included. I think that's very important, uh, important for all readers of this comic to be, to feel represented from the very first issue. Like little boys, I'm sorry, you're not represented in this first issue. <laughs> I'm sure you will be though. So just hang on, you, you will be. Uh, got some comments here about the parents. Uh, it's rare in my experience that young reader titles address the everyday nuances in relationships with parents as anything more than an obstacle, yet here they play along with the kids as they do their parent stuff. Love that. The addition of the parents to both of the kids was well done, and they weren't the usual, usual tropes for parents. These are supportive yet sensible parents who let the kids get on with their own play. As a parent, I really appreciate the writing of the characters. And the last one on that topic, the purple wizard's parents, Willow, are brought in as equal characters to the heroes with distinct personalities and clear goals in their dialogue. The girls speak respectfully to them, eat at the table properly, say please and thank you, 
and get along as a household very well, which is an odd thing to take away from this issue, but I enjoy seeing a seemingly healthy family unit portrayed in a comic. Then we have the spunky blonde warrior who does not share the same family dynamic, which we learn in a poignant scene toward the end of the issue. Her mother obviously loves her fiercely and takes care of her, but she is simply too tired to function at her best, which is another painfully real situation that a lot of families find themselves in. Um, yes, all of that. And I'm not going to read it. I will link to it, though, because you should read it. Jeremy actually took to Twitter to address some not complaints is the word, but some people were disturbed, maybe, by Wisp's house um, and the comparison to Willow's. It's almost like they were thinking, oh, she's being neglected. Oh, poor Wisp doesn't have any love or any obviously her mom loves her a lot, which is probably why she's worn out, is because she's worked herself to death. Um, we don't know if there's a father in the picture. You know, she describes the car as her mom's car, um, so it might be a single parent situation. Hopefully we'll find out in a future issue. But basically he said in his tweets that both um, portrayals of households are normal and not... not one is not bad, or uh, how do I say this? Um, one does not churn out all good kids, and one does not churn out all bad kids. Like, he identifies more with Wisp's upbringing himself, and he turned out well, so there. Uh, <laughs> for people who are making assumptions based on home life, I think Wisp is just fine, um, but it is great that she has Willow as a friend and that her family has brought her in as a second daughter, basically, and treats her just the same. That's awesome. And I'm going to pause this again because it's probably going to cut me off and I have a few more things to talk about and then I'll be done, I promise. One more time. I apologize. I did not mean for this to be this long. <laughs> Maybe I chose a few too many quotes, but there were so many good ones it was hard to narrow down. So regarding canon, there are a few quotes here. The first issue also stays fairly faithful to the original Rainbow Bright stories, and the presence of the King of Shadows minions serves the issue and series well in establishing what's at stake. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, because a fictional character can be used in many different mediums, and each of those mediums can be different among themselves, so a story in a storybook, comic book, or video game probably won't be mentioned in the TV show of the same fictional character. As a fictional character grows over the years, these stories can change. These changes do not make the previous stories invalid or wrong, but grow and enrich its world. Very succinctly put, that was actually from Renee over on RainbowBright.co, um, which I just... the very succinct, good way of putting it, that this is not changing previous stories, this is just adding to it and giving us more info and just more. More everything! Next comment, if I know anything about what fans value most in the reboot of a creative property, however, it's how well each new adaptation preserves its original source material. After reading issue one of Dynamite's new Rainbow Bright comic, I'd suggest those picking up this comic on brand recognition alone might need to adjust their expectations accordingly. Regardless, every story has the potential to be someone's first experience of a particular genre, and this would be a solid introduction to the world of Rainbow Bright. I think I said as much in my last review video, which was adjust your expectations. You're not going to open it up and see the 80s cartoon, but that's okay. And I love how they put that. Um, where did it go? Every story has the potential to be someone's first experience of a particular genre. So some kids, this is going to be their first glimpse into Rainbow Land at the character of Rainbow Bright, of Wisp, of Willow, of all of this, um, and that this is a good introduction. Like, we're not giving them garbage. This is, this is a very well done comic. So, it, you know, some parents might want to show them the show first and get them interested that way and then show them the comic. Some may want to do it the other way around. Some may want to only show them the comic and not show them the old show at all. It's completely up to the parent. Um, and up to what the child likes or dislikes. But if this is all a kid sees and knows about Rainbow Bright, I think they're in for a treat. I think they're gonna get some really cool content, and we're gonna get some really cool content. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Uh, okay, two more comments on this. 
I think really great reboot. Sorry, I've been reading too much. I think really great reboots distill what was really great about an older property and bring that kernel forward into a modern sensibility. It's a good quote. That's well put, because that's exactly what's what's happening here. Jeremy is taking the heart, the soul, the color of the original Rainbow Bright, and he's bringing it into a modern sensibility. He's just changing it up for today's world, for today's kids, and I think it's going to be great. Uh, next comment. If this comic had... This is also from Renee. Gotta point that out. Uh, if this comic had any other name on it other than Rainbow Bright, it would be equally enjoyable. I'm interested in seeing the story progress and seeing what elements from the original world is used and what has changed. The Rainbow Bright of my generation is still mine. This new one is promising. I look forward to more. Exactly. We will always have our old one. She will always be ours. And also, whatever, you know, new kids, new kids. <laughs> when it starts to get new kids on the block, I'm not going to subject you to that. Um, but there are children who have also been raised on the cartoon because their parents are my age and they've shown it to them. Uh, but it's great that this will be for a new generation that may not have seen the show. So yeah, great. A uh, few short comments about some feminism that I picked up on. Um, one just mentioned girl power energy. Yes. Um, another was, I was immediately struck by the clear and solid friendship between these two girls. So much girl oriented media engages with mean girl stories, the type that feed the worst examples of preteen girl infighting. This is especially awful when media is targeted at girls who are most likely to be vulnerable to that sort of social interaction. Yes. <laughs> We need more stories like this with girls who actually get along, uh, are not bullying each other, are not making fun of each other, are not just talking about hair and makeup and boys. Um, this is a perfect example. What's that? I don't think I put that quote in here. There's something about it passing the Betchel test. I'm probably mispronouncing that. If you know what that is, it passes it with flying colors. Um, but it's basically what I just said. And yeah. It's, that's so important. We need more, more media like this. So yay. And the last one, friendship, particularly female friendship is a very important aspect to this comic. And I would agree. Um, and I'm sure going forward, like I said before, we're going to see, uh, characters of other genders. So I'm very interested to see the girl boy interactions that I'm sure will not all be romantic as in some properties. So I'm, I'm really interested to see uh, what's going to be coming later on. Yay. And then some miscellaneous comments that didn't fit into any of those categories, but I still thought were, were important. Uh, we know so much about Wisp before she gets to Rainbow Land, which allows for what I think may be the ultimate female escapist fantasy, not becoming some sort of superhero in our world, but being whisked away from the real world to a place where people see that we are special. There are plenty of stories that start with a female heroine in a fantasy world, and she kicks, gets to kick butt there, but the daydream of being plain us in our world and then a magical heroine in another world, that's something else altogether. For me, a kid who used to look for the way to get to Ponyland every time I saw a rainbow, it's something incredibly, well, magical. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I think I made a comment similar to this when I was talking to Jeremy about this rem reminding me of Harry Potter, where it's normal you, but you could be a witch or wizard, and you could get your Hogwarts letter, and you could be whisked away to this other world that you're a part of and you have superpowers. So that's very much in the same vein uh, in this comic, and I love that dynamic so much, so much. Next comment, with bright and cheery personalities, Willow and Wisp are very much every little girl who's dreamt of grand adventures and epic battles with her friends, a demographic underrepresented in comics. There you go. It's, yeah, I think I just said that, but I'll say it again. We need more comics like this. <laughs> need more. But hey, we, we got this one. We're making progress. Yay. Thank you, Dynamite, and everyone else involved in this. <laughs> Uh, where was I? Here we go. Regarding Wisp and Willow, uh, while they are not like everyone else, they are perfect for each other. They embrace their differences and complement each other's personalities. I love that. 
like I said, they're, they're kind of the nerdy, geeky, possible outcasts. We don't know how they are at school, if they have other friends or if they are ostracized so they found each other, but whatever the case, they complement each other perfectly. Uh, next comment. This is very clearly targeted at a younger audience, but it's got kind of a Calvin and Hobbes or Adventure Time feel to it, like it has room to expand. It feels like this comic is likely to mature over time, and I'm excited to see some of the content and topics that will be addressed moving forward. Absolutely. The next comment. Wisp compliments her on... Oh. Compliments Willow. I should have taken out the her because you're like, who are you talking about? I'll just say Willow. Wisp compliments Willow on a cape and well-made... Wait, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Wisp compliments Willow on a cape well-made and expresses her desire to make armor and a sword. Her grandfather once worked in a furniture store with machines. How hard could it be? Oh, to be young again. Now I'm going to take issue for one second with this comment. Um, yes to the first things you said. I love that Willow is into learning how to sew and make her own costumes and being crafty. Um, but I also love that Wisp, I did say that right, Willow? Willow with the sewing? Yeah, Wisp. Sometimes I say one or the other and I'm like, did I just say the right one? Okay, yeah. But I don't think Wisp saying she wants to learn how to forge metal is just a oh to be young again kind of dream. No. That is the sign of a maker being married to one. I know the signs. And that is the sign of a maker girl. I mean, both of them are, just in different ways. Making costumes is one way to be a maker. Making weapons and armor is another way to be a maker. Making programs is another. There's so many ways to be a maker. Um, but that is what she wants to do. She wants to learn how to forge metal. And she could, like, don't say, oh, to be young again, as if a kid can't learn to do that. Like, they would obviously need supervision at that young of an age, working with things that hot and heavy, etc. It would be difficult for them. But they could absolutely learn by watching. And they would probably, be, someone like this would be fascinated to watch someone do welding or any kind of metal work. Um, so I didn't, I didn't read that part and just think, oh, what a silly idea. This little girl wants to make armor. No, I read it and was immediately like, yes, 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 yes. We need more girls that want to learn how to do things like this and things that are not specifically girly. Um, I thought that was fantastic. I love that she made her, at least it looked like she made her own wooden sword. Um, so she's already on her way. She's already learning how to like shape wood and cobble it together to look like a sword. Um, so I, I love that about Wisp. I love um, her, curio her curiosity, her desire to learn new skills and screw, you know, society's expectations of little girls. She can forge metal if she wants to. You hear me? Yeah. I hope she gets to do that in Rainbow Land. <laughs> Next comment. While this first issue is a bit of a slow burn, there's plenty to enjoy. Whitley puts a tremendous amount of heart in this soft reboot of the beloved 80s franchise. The cliffhanger ending does point, does point an arrow in the direction of the series and definitely makes me want to read what happens next. Our heroines are creative, innocent, and fun, which is the perfect description for this series so far and exactly the type of book we need more of in these dark, in these often dark, colorless times. Yes! So many people agreeing with me. We need more comics like this. <laughs> next comment. The first half of the issue is mainly about laying the groundwork and world building. Willow and Wisp spend most of this time playing in their fantasy world together. The intensity that they play with is both amusing and endearing. Traditionally, in this style of story, we get a view of what the girls see when they are playing, but not this time around. We see them as we would see our own kids running around the lawn yelling about foul beasts trying to destroy them. It helps us transition to when monsters really are trying to get them later in the book. I thought this was great. Um, again, I don't read enough comics to have thought, oh yeah, usually when they're imagining, you would see that on the page, but we, we don't. You don't see that. It's all in their head, so it gets to be all in your head as well when you're reading what they're imagining, what they're seeing. You get to see your own version, which is fun. And like they said, then it makes the reveal of the actual real monsters at the end that much more impressive. So I just thought that was a really, a really cool point. Um, 
there is something vaguely disturbing about Twinkle, and this is where knowledge of the character's history would probably come in handy. I assume from the cover that this is a sidekick character to Rainbow Bright, but I'm not 100% certain of it. Perhaps it's his eyebrows, which come across as more menacing than annoyed, or perhaps it's his snippy attitude, but I'm not entirely keen on this character just yet. This is the one and only place in this issue where I genuinely felt like there was a part of the story that I was supposed to be getting that I just wasn't. I wanted to include this one. It is a little negative, but I agree with part of it. Um, not the part that you should be getting something that you weren't. Um, if I could talk to this person, I would say, no, you didn't miss anything. Um, what he says is what he means. There, There's there's no backstory that would have helped explain him better because he's he's just different um, in this iteration of Rainbow Bright. He talks differently than he would. I, yeah, he just he's just different. Um, so having prior knowledge of Rainbow Bright would not have helped this individual like Twink better, I don't think. And I do agree about the eyebrows. I'm sorry. Um, I don't hate it. It was just, in a few panels, I was like, why does he look so angry? Um, I mean, the one time where she's, like, talking about taking her shirt off, and he's like, young lady, don't take your shirt off. I mean, sure, it makes sense. And it's funny for him to have the super angry eyebrows during that panel. But there were some panels where he was saying something not angry, but he still had the angry eyebrows. So I was just a little, like, is he always angry now? I don't think he is. Um... But that's just, if, if I have any complaints about the art, it's the two that I mentioned. It's the eyes sometimes turning to pupils and Twinkle's eyebrows. But the pupils I've already gotten over. I don't really think that would bother me. The eyebrows might. Um, again, most of these are close-up shots of Twink. So maybe that's why we're really noticing. And they are really thick <laughs> and dark. Um, but... Maybe it's just because there's drama going on and he's trying to get her out of there and he doesn't have enough power to do it immediately. So they have to go find power and power up. And I don't know why they decided to make his eyes look kind of angry, but they kind of do in most of the panels. But I'm just going to put my request, my my opinion, that I hope in the future he doesn't always look angry. That, that's all. But I still love Twink. That um, his dialogue is hysterical and just his personality and the way he is kind of leaning back in the air at one point while he's floating along it's he's so funny he's really cute it was just yeah the eyebrows threw me off a couple of times so i just wanted to mention that uh two more almost done further for books aimed at younger audiences there is the additional risk of being too preachy or heavy-handed this book never really falls into that it does emphasize the kind of morals you would expect but it does so in a way that feels natural. Ideas like friends sharing with each other, keeping the house tidy, and doing your chores before bed are shown in a positive light without shoving them in your face. This book could easily have felt like an 80s PSA infomercial, but it avoids that. Yes, all of that. I love that. Um, Cause yeah, you're, the, this individual is absolutely right. Um, some writers, trying to get across those things could co could go about it in a preachy way, but Jeremy absolutely does not. The art absolutely does not. It's just, it's a natural way of how these girls have been raised and how they live and how they take care of themselves and their, their rooms, their homes. Um, and I love that. It's, and you know, the parents aren't constantly yelling at them like, oh, you gotta do this. It, you know, they're reminding them Hey, don't wear muddy shoes in the house. Hey, don't run down the stairs. Be safe. But it's not, like some of the other comments said, it's not the typical parent tropes that we see in a lot of things that are making fun of parents. This is positive to both adults and kids. That's important. We need that. Okay, last comment. Rainbow Bright number one is a shining example of what an all-ages title should aim for. It obviously is going to be more lighthearted and innocent than your normal comics, but it doesn't shy away from subtlety and nuance. Most all-ages titles feel that they have to explain every little thing in extreme detail, but Rainbow Bright number one is content to let you put some pieces together. There we go! I don't 
think there was any other comments I needed to say. I think um, I was able to jump off of all of those with all of my own... I'm just going to flip through real quick to make sure there was nothing else obvious that I wanted to mention. Um, I think... I, I, I think I got it all, but I just wish, because I know I'm going to turn this off and be like, oh man, I meant to mention, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. So I'm just flipping through real quick. Imagine the cats. Yeah. I love the cat shirt. <laughs> no, I, yeah, that, that's everything. Um, and there are so many other comments apart from the ones I read, I picked out some of my favorites and some that highlighted things I wanted to highlight, but they just did it much better than I could. <laughs> it's like, why say a thing poorly when someone else has already said it well and I can just read their version. So again, you should read through all of the reviews. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a link to my blog post. And in that blog post, it's a link to all of these articles. You should totally give them a read if you are interested in what others think about this comment, because this isn't all of it by any means. There are a lot of good points made by a lot of really um, intelligent people, um, people who know comics and who care about comics and care that stuff like this is being made and are happy about that. So yeah, I, I think that's all for now. I'm just, I'm super, super happy that this is here. But all of these are here in my hand. I'm I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled. Once I get the um the version virgin can't say that word virgin covers, I will show those off to you in a future video. I'm sure. Um, I think I have another merch haul I need to do. So <laughs> maybe it'll just get thrown in there. We'll see. I'm I'm I've got a backlog of things I need to be reviewing and talking about, and it's been busy lately, you guys. A new Shira cartoon is coming out next month and that's been a thing that I've been also trying to keep on top of and a lot of stuff. It's good stuff. It's like Christmas came early. I mean, this is my birthday month. October, it's, it's all for me, obviously. Okay. Um, happy early birthday to me. I'm getting all this wonderfulness at the beginning of the month and there's still a lot more of the month to go. But there we go. I think that's all for the moment. I'm probably going to remember something else I meant to say. Oh, I did at least, do I have my calendar open? I think it was on Dynamite's website. I saw when the next issue is supposed to come out and it is November 14th. That's when it is currently slated to be released. If I hear anything different, I'll let you know. But for right now, put it on your calendars. November 14th is when issue two is going to be released. Um, so you may want to go ahead and pre-order that one with your local comic shop, like hopefully some of you did with this one, like I did. Because I, I literally walked into the shop and I was just like, hey, I'm here to pick up my thing. Here's my box number and boom, there they were. Easy peasy, which is good because the guy was kind of distracted. I, <laughs> I don't know what was going on. He, I think he was working on a couple different things at once. So he was like, he gave me those things and I was like, okay. And I was like, oh wait, I also want, I need this other thing. And he ran and he got me that and I paid for that. and I. Literally, I went out of my car and I was like, oh man, I meant to get copies. Because I, the ones he handed me were just these, the, the three loose ones and the the um, blank one. And then I was like, oh wait, I wanted to get other ones. Um, so I went back in. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm three transactions later. I'm finally finished. Um, and I did take a picture of the shelves that had the Rainbow Bright comic in it. Because I was just so like, oh. <gasps> she's there, like mixed in with all of these other really famous comics that people are going to be coming in to buy. And then they'll see Rainbow Bright and go, oh, there's a Rainbow Bright comic out. And then they'll buy it. And then they're going to be just as excited about it as I am and hopefully get more of it. And then it'll hopefully keep going forever and ever and ever. Not just the six issues that I think are currently slated, whatever the word for that is. Um, I want this to keep going for a long time long time because I, I really think good things are, are coming. Um, I think it's going to be really fun. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. I I really am going to go now. I, but I did want to mention my little comic store experience. It was it was brief, but it was it was still fun just to see it there on the shelves and to have it in my hand, bring it home and do this video for all of you a few days later <laughs> because I've been busy. Anyway, I hope you're all doing great. 
please tell me what you think of the comic in the comments. I want to hear all of your opinions and your opinions on anything I said or comments that I read. Um, I'm always happy to discuss this more after the video is over. So until next time, have a rainbow day. Bye.